Bob raises bees without pesticides or antibiotics and sells honey and bees through his business, Cold Country Queen. He is the founder of the Russian Honeybee Beater Breeders Association and lives in Little Valley in New York. So please welcome Bob to talk about bees, the type of bees. Thank you, Cecile. <laughs> Uh, there's been an awful lot of attention about honeybees and what's going on with the bees and losing bees and all the bees are dying and, and there's some truth to it. Uh, there's a lot of truth to it, uh, but there is an awful lot of hype uh, also. Uh, I think the hype part is that they act like it's a big mystery and it's not a big mystery. It's things that we're all aware of and that really I think deep down we all know it's affecting us as well. Uh, I think to put it into a few words you can say what's going on with the bees is life in the 21st century. Simply put. Uh, I'd like to go back and give a little bit of history of beekeeping and where, where we were and where we've come. Uh, I'd say the, the golden age for beekeeping was probably the early 1900s. At that time, it was a largely agrarian country still at that point. Uh, uh, most of the population lived in rural areas. Lots and lots and lots of small farms, diverse farms. Uh, the, on those farms, people grew an awful lot of their own food. Uh, they had animals, they pastured animals. They, uh, and plus, they basically, they made their own living, their own food, and had a cash crop or a few cash crops. Uh, that meant that there was lots of biodiversity. Uh, and, and biodiversity is good for bees. Bees need a balanced diet. They need, uh, they need, they get their proteins and their lipids from pollen. They need three essential amino acids and some pollens have some of those, but not all of them, and other pollens have others of them, and some pollens don't have any of them, and a few pollens have all of them, which is a, a great meal for the bees. But in any case, there was lots of diversity of pollen out there, and they could, they could get what they needed all the time, pretty much. Uh, and uh, pastures had sweet clover planted and, and uh, Dutch clover, Elsite clover, uh, all kinds of good nectar sources also, so they had all the carbohydrates they needed. So uh, it, was a, it was a healthy environment for bees. Uh, around that time, beekeepers were really starting to understand bees also. Uh, they knew that they, they began, they really got to know what bees needed to be healthy, what they needed, uh, how they could help bees to make a maximum honey crop, both for the bees and for the beekeeper, and how to prepare them for winter, help them to get through tough winters. Uh, I think around 1930 was the peak number of colonies in the United States. It peaked at about roughly six million colonies kept by people. Plus there were all the bees out in the wild, honeybees, as well as other pollinators. Currently there's, well we've had beekeepers have really put some energy into building up their numbers again, but we were down to about two and a quarter, maybe a little more than two and a quarter million colonies a few years ago. Maybe we're between two and a quarter and two and a half million uh, kept colonies. Uh, but as that trend from the early 1900s to, say, 1930, as that uptrend was happening, there was also a, another trend started, uh, which would start taking us in the, uh, the other direction. Uh, I think if we wanted to point at one thing, it was probably the, uh, the introduction of uh, tractors and a lot of mechani more mechanization. 
And, you know, it's just a tool, and you can do good things with a tool, but you can do bad things with a tool also. Uh, and what happened is farms started getting bigger. They started specializing more. Uh, so now you're getting larger plantings of single crops. Uh, and, and this was a long-term trend until now we have acreages of... I was in California a few years ago and I, I uh, looked, at, looked out at roughly 10,000 acres of plantings of new almonds. It was just massive as far as the eye can see. Now, maybe there's a few weeds along the ditch banks, but <laughs> there's not much out there nutritionally for bees. And that is what conventional agriculture uh, has come to be. It's, uh, it's, it's huge, and that's just not as good a, uh, a situation for bees. So the honey crops started going down. Uh, at the same time as those honey crops went down and the biodiversity went down, well, what else happens? Now the pest, it's kind of counterintuitive, but we're losing a, a lot of insects, but the pests can have a field day. If there's some pest that's focused on, that, that does well on one crop, and now they got 10,000 acres of it, and less beneficials or less uh, uh, predators of those uh, to keep them in balance, those populations just explode. So now what are we going to do? Well, here comes pesticides, and you know, they, they uh, uh, I won't even get into the artificial fertilizers, the synthetic fertilizers, but uh, pesticides started coming onto the scene more and more. Uh, interest, this, this is kind of interesting to me, kind of a historical note related to that. But I think it was 43 or 44, uh, World War II, and in Yolo County, California, uh, there was lots of beekeeping. A fellow named Harry Whitcomb was a, a pretty large, successful commercial beekeeper, and he, uh, he started taking tremendous losses to his bees. And uh, what was going on, they grow a lot of alfalfa there for the dairy cows and, and for horses and for uh, beef cattle. And, uh, they were growing tremendous acreages of tomatoes also. And these tomatoes were being canned. Most, uh, an awful lot of it was going to soldiers in the Pacific Theater in, in, in Europe. Uh, and you know, that was, that was kind of sacrosanct. You gotta, can't get in the way of what the soldiers need. But uh, they were spraying them with the soup du jour of the day chemical for pesticide chemical was lead arsenic. Wonderful stuff. And uh, it was wiping out the bees. They were real sloppy with applications. There were no restrictions. So they'd be spraying when it was windy. It'd blow into the alfalfa fields and the bees are working the alfalfa or the, or the sunflowers or the safflower or any of the other crops around. And, and it was just wiping out the bees in those situations that were exposed to the lead arsenic. And Harry Whitcomb started making a lot of noise and talking to other beekeepers, and they were having losses too, and word got around. Uh, maybe, this, maybe this is one of the starts of the original greens, huh? I don't know. But uh, they, uh, you know, it's, we're a small industry. We're a cornerstone agricultural industry, but we're tiny in numbers and in dollars, the almighty dollar. And so... We might have been talking loud, but our voice wasn't carrying very far. But you know, the dairymen, they were bailing up that hay and feeding it to their, their, their dairy cows or their beef cows or whatever. And boy, they started dying real quick too. And they knew right where it was coming from because these beekeepers were making noise. And uh, they took it to the, their complaints to the county agricultural commissioner. In California, there's uh, County Commissions for Agriculture, Commissioner of Agriculture and Weights and Measures, they enforce most of the state laws. And uh, they had a hearing, and uh, the, the tomato guys, big, big corporations, they were there with their lawyers and all. 
uh, all these hot shots and, and on the other side of the table is the beekeepers and, and, and some dairymen. And it was the first time ever that there were, it was a big surprise, uh, the, the beekeepers and the, the people that wanted some restrictions placed on the pesticides won their first little battle. It's, it's been a hell of a battle ever since and we're still fighting it, but it's one for us, you know? It was uh, the, the start. Uh, we've got more pests, we got uh, more pesticides, lousy honey production, but you know what? Now we need honeybees. We need to pay beekeepers. Shoot, we need to pay beekeepers to come in here to pollinate our crops. There used to be enough wild pollinators or just wild bees or kept bees everywhere that there was plenty. They didn't have to. That was not a, a, what they call an input, a cost to most growers that needed pollination. Well, now they need pollination and they were willing to pay for it. And beekeepers uh, started making uh, an increasing amount of their income through pollination. Hasn't been all rosy. <laughs> uh, the pesticide kills continued and you know, there's arguments and lawsuits and you know, we're supposed to be working together, but when, when there's some bug killing my crop, boy, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do what I gotta do. Uh, so there have been problems ever since that way and a lot of friction and trying to work together, but a lot of friction and a lot of bee losses and uh, that has only increased as the plantings have gotten better, bigger. Currently, commercial beekeepers make 70 to 80 percent of their income on pollination fees, not on honey production. So. What kind of stress is that? Every time you load your beehives on a truck to do a pollination job, that's a stress. Every pollination job is two moves, one in, one out. It's a stress. Poor nutrition, poor nutrition, a real struggle to get a balanced diet, maybe not much nectar available. That's a, another stress. Uh, fungicides, fungicides are the conventional wisdom until probably five or six years ago, was that fungicides are harmless to bees. Well, it ain't true. It's a little tricky, it takes a little time, but uh, bees use pollen for two reasons. Secondary, they use the, a little bit of it for the adults, for themselves, to provide them with proteins and lipids especially important in the fall to when they're preparing to go into winter, they have to build up their protein and lipid levels. But they also, the, the primary use that pollen's put to is to make baby food, brood food. They gather the pollen from the plants. They, the foragers add microbes to this pollen as they're gathering it on their back legs, on the little pollen basket. They bring it into the hive, give it to the nurse bees, they add more microbes to it. Now these microbes they're adding, it helps to preserve the pollen and it also helps to uh, make the nutrition available to the bees. Pollen grains have a hard, uh, a really hard shell that uh, nutritionists will tell you humans can't get any, derive any benefit from pollen because they can't digest it because of this hard shell. But I think what those nutritionists don't know is that the bees add microbes to it. So if you're collecting bee pollen, it's been prepared for your, well, not specifically for your benefit, but it works to your benefit so that we can, we can uh, get the nutrition out of it. We can benefit from it. Uh, well, guess what? The fungicides, interfere with the action of those microbes. And so, once more, bees are getting, not getting the nutrition they need. Uh, pesticides, one more little, well, two more little things with pesticides. In around 2005, beekeepers all over the country, and I can, afterward, I'll, I can tell you my personal story, started noticing huge losses, additional losses. That's when you heard about CCD, 
colony collapse disorder, the big mystery, what's happening with the bees, you know? Uh, well, I've already told you, the increase of the stresses, the lowering of the honey crops, the losses to pesticides, the poor nutrition. Uh, maybe these new pesticides that came in right around that time, systemic pesticides, usually seed treatments, so that the seed is treated before it's planted, uh, that's when they were introduced. And they're called neonicotinoids, is the largest class of them. Lots of different formulations, and uh, uh, imidacloprid has gotten the most attention. Uh, clothionidin is just killer on bees. Uh, they're neurotoxins. And the way this stuff works is, well, I'll give my, my example. The bees gather pollen from, in my case, corn, field corn. All, virtually all the field corn now is systemically treated seed. It's expressed throughout the plant, throughout the life of the plant. The bees gather the pollen, the foragers gather the pollen. They bring it back and give it to the hive bees, the, the nurse bees, and, uh, and it's stored or, and used and fed, used to, to produce royal jelly to the feed to the larva. It doesn't seem to do much, if anything, to the foragers or to, or to the adults in that form. It does in some other ways, but uh, when they utilize that pollen to produce royal jelly, and they feed that jelly, royal jelly to the larva, they, they feed it from the time it's a tiny little egg that hatches as they're developing larval stage for four or five days. And those bees are cognitively screwed up. Short-term memory, long-term memory is screwed up. They can't navigate. They can't find their way home. That's the disappearing bees mystery. Uh, so, you know, the hives are going downhill, but there's no dead bees like with past pesticide kills. It doesn't kill the hive right now. It does over time as they're feeding this pollen. And uh, in my case, a month later, I'm going out to put honey supers on in September for our big goldenrod honey flow and uh, those yards that I had watched very carefully bring in corn pollen predominantly there were three that I watched and two of them you know around corn and two of them brought in corn pollen probably because there weren't any better alternatives those those hives none of those hives needed supers they didn't need to have any additional space they weren't growing the population like they should to make the big honey crop and they weren't looking real good uh, Looking kind of old, not many young bees. Uh, I, I'm sure all bees look alike to most of you folks, but <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, they didn't need any supers. They weren't looking very good. And four to six weeks later, they were all dead or dying. And that's just going into winter. You know, they got to be primed. They, they, they make all this preparation. Uh, they change their behavior so that the young bees that all, the, the bees, worker bees live six to eight weeks during the summer. They're constantly replacing the population because they're working themselves to death, mostly producing brood, more bees to keep the whole thing going. But they change their behavior late in the year, really starting in August. And the bees they're raising that are supposed to make it through maybe six months through the winter, they're, they're toast and the hive is toast. And, you know, if that's how you make your living, you're toast. So it's, uh, these things are sneaky. I'll throw antibiotics in there. Antibiotics, there was one antibiotic that beekeepers used primarily, and it was overused. Not all beekeepers did, but most of the commercial guys, you know, it, it turned into industrial agriculture just like other parts of agriculture largely did. Not everybody, but mostly. And uh, they started preventively applying uh, teramycin, the antibiotic teramycin, to prevent or to treat American fowl brood disease. In, we started getting genetically modified plants coming online around 1900, or pardon me, 1990. I think tomato was one of the first, and 
you know, you could throw it up against the wall and it bounce against the wall and it still wouldn't rot and you could wouldn't bruise and you could get it to the market. It was great, except it didn't it tasted so bad nobody wanted it. So they gave up on that. Then they did the potato, I know. That was you know, that's kind of a major crop and and that one I guess worked, even though they didn't tell you that you know, the, nutritionally it was deficient, 20% uh, less protein the first time they checked it. Of course, that just went away, you know, they don't talk about that much. Uh, but the first major crop, to, genetically modified crop, major crop, was rapeseed, canola. And initially, they don't use this process anymore, but initially, what they wanted to do is, uh, put a Roundup Ready treat, trait, set that trait into the canola, the rapeseed, so that they could spray their crop and kill the weeds and not hurt the canola. And they piggybacked onto that Roundup Ready trait a teramycin trait. And they did it for two reasons. So they did it so that to help in the process, the industrial process of making this, this, uh, this seed what they would do is they'd take a medium of the genetic material of the, of the, of the plant, think petri dish or something, uh, and they'd actually shoot into it with what's called a gene gun, and it kind of looks a little bit like a gun, and they'd shoot this, uh, they'd have a medium of the genetic material of the plant, and they'd shoot into it the, the, uh, the Roundup Ready trait and piggybacked onto that the Teramycin trait. And then they exposed this medium to a uh, a bacteria and the bacteria would kill that which didn't have the teramycin so I'll say the good stuff died and they had nothing but pure bad stuff I'm editorializing here they have the pure stock they want now and they could mass produce it initially this was planted in three places Argentina the prairie provinces of Canada and the upper Midwest of the United States. And interestingly, within two years, American fowl brew disease started showing resistance to teramycin. And it showed up in three places, Argentina, the prairie provinces, and the upper Midwest. This was like, I think it was first planted in like 95, 96 in a big way. Uh, here in New York State, we got a great beekeeper, Joe Rowland. He's a Cornell graduate. He's uh, made his living as beekeeping. He's very concerned about environmental issues. Uh, he lives in Owego, right close to Ithaca. Uh, his wife is a, uh, an employee at Cornell University. And uh, he had been following, he was very concerned about the GM plants and he had been following how this trait was set and and he was concerned and he was a beekeeper and he made the connection immediately when it was reported that American fowl brood disease was showing resistance to teramycin. He was on the board of directors, he's a friend of mine, I was on the board of directors of the Empire State Honey Producers Association, which is the state association. We brought it to the board of directors and the board of directors said, yeah, by golly, that." That's kind of scary. We should take that to our land grant university, Cornell University, working for us. And we talked. One of us for the association approached the appro what we felt was the appropriate individual at Cornell. And, and I will say they were good enough to be honest with us. They said, Folks, please don't use my name, but no one here is going to look at this. And explained how just in the previous year, uh, Dow Agrochemicals and Monsanto and DuPont and I think it was a big five had donated $248 million to Cornell University. One year, one university, that's almost a quarter of a billion dollars. Now, what do you think the administration, they would have thought about one of any of their researchers looking at something that threatened $248 billion and 
financial help. Help. Uh, a couple of years, anyway, that, that, that went nowhere, but a year or two later, there were two young researchers in, from some university in Germany, the name escapes me. I remember it, it had a long history of entomological studies and specifically uh, apicultural honeybees. And these researchers went over to Argentina. They positively identified this teramycin trait living in the digestive tract in the midgut of the bee. Living there. Now, I didn't see the research, uh, but word gets out, you know, whether it's published or not. And uh, the word did get out, and the university was threatened with, threatened with withholding of funding and the administration came down on those two, uh, two researchers like a ton of bricks, and it never got published, and it just went away. So one of the things that's wrong with bees is life in this 21st century, uh, uh, the best democracy money can buy, you know? Corporate, corporate democracy. Uh, there's one of the good things about the attention given to bees in the last few years, even though it's kind of misdirected, it's, it was, I can see some good that's come out of it. You know, if you scare the public, they'll say, well, what are you doing about it? And, and we did get some money for some researchers that don't care if it's going to be the end of their career. They're going to do the right thing. And they looked into things, and, and we have found out some good things, like those neonicotinoids, how they kill bees. Uh, to finish that little story, add one more to that one. It takes four parts per billion. Did I, did I tell you that part? It takes four parts per billion of imetoclopred, which isn't the worst, to uh, start affecting larval development in bees. Um, but there's been a lot of research in how much pesticide residues are in beeswax. There were, there's been a lot of studies by a lot of different researchers in those areas. Uh, independently, uh, Judy Wu in Washington State at Washington State University and uh, Jennifer Berry down in University of Georgia in Athens were doing the same kind of similar work, and they both understood that the commercially available foundation, which is what bee, the beeswax that beekeepers buy and put into wooden frames to help the bees get started and put the comb where the beekeeper can manage it, it's all polluted. It's polluted from multiple pesticides, including some that the, the beekeepers themselves are using. I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, so in order to do a good study, you need to have a control group. And we've got to have some clean stuff to see how the bad stuff is affecting the bees. Where the heck are we going to come up with that? Well, there's ways to get bees to, to make their own comb entirely uh, and have them put it pretty much where you want it. And it's, it's, you know, it's an extra step commercial beekeepers don't want to do it, uh, but uh, uh, they undertook that. And the bees made, made their own comb, and they sampled this comb, and guess what? Lots of pesticide residues. I'll just say, you know, we also, just like the bees, we're all downstream, we're all downwind, we're all eating food grown in the same soil. Uh, and there's no studies being done on long-term or sublethal effects on bees or humans or anything else. It's only, you know, after there's a bunch of horribly deformed kids or, or some other similar disaster that they will really focus inten attention and go f further. The studies are based, still based on uh, what's called an LD50 the lethal dose that kills 50% of whatever you're looking at, honeybees, in 24 hours. 
So that wouldn't show any damage. These, you know, that would show these systemic pesticides, the neonicotinoids, for instance. They're harmless. <laughs> Even though it's killing your bees, two months later they're all dying. It looks good to the EPA. Uh, I don't want to get too much off into the political side. I want to kind of stick to bees, but you know, the same people that run Monsanto will next year be, in run, be running the EPA or the Department of Agriculture, and then when they retire from that, they go back to the board of directors of, you know, Dow Agrochemicals or whatever. It's uh, more of that stuff. Uh, it's a great little book called The Farming Ladder. It was written in 1948. And it was written by a fella, George Henderson, and he and his brother, from the time they were actually, before they were 10 years old, they were determined. These are extraordinary young individuals. They were determined to be farmers. They were kind of city folks, but they just wanted to farm. They'd spent all their spare time helping farmers. Uh, when the local soldier went off to war, the fella asked them to take care of his chickens. He came back like three or four years later from the war, and these kids who were eight and 10 years old when they started this, they had kept books. Every penny they spent, the co every cost, how many chickens, what happened to everyone, how much they sold to the penny, and they handed him all the profits, all the money that was made. And he, he read that, and he got tears in his eyes. It makes me tear up. And he said, you didn't take anything out for labor. And they just looked at him like, what are you kidding? What you were doing for us? These are good people. And they were extraordinary. You don't, you don't find people that are that dedicated to, to something like farming either. <laughs> I mean, who knows when they're eight years old what they want to do for the rest of your life. Uh, but these guys were kind of maniacs, but they were great farmers. They lived through this change to... You know, everybody was organic farmers when they started farming, and they understood the importance of the soil and, and, and you know, maximum production per acre, you know, and efficiency. Uh, and they were hugely successful throughout this transitional period. And they saw this change and thought, they, they just didn't understand how it was happening, but it's the same stuff as what happened with Monsanto and centralization and money talks and but all these things helped corporations but you know all through that period there's less farmers less farms bigger acreages environmental damage uh, incredible if if one just steps back it's it's so sad but in any case i want a, a short quote from the farming ladder which was written in 44 in the soil lies all that remains of the work of countless generations of the dead. We hold this sacred trust to maintain the fertility and pass it on unimpaired to the unborn generations to come. Besides soil and food, uh, soil, water, and air, What's more important to give to your kids and your grandkids and everybody that comes afterward? You know, you can't eat money. Uh, what's wrong with enough? Uh, why not let's do it efficiently and, and, and properly? Uh, currently, in polar bears in the, Antar in the Arctic and penguins in the Antarctic, there's PCBs and all kinds of things. In every one of your fat cells, every one, there's polystyrene. I don't know if, it's any, if it hurts you. I don't know, but there's lots of funny things going on. Uh, you know, I told you about that beeswax they checked. It's, uh, it's, it's really frightening. It's, it's, uh, it's not good. Uh, we're losing species left and right. 
a couple, you know, pollinators. Uh, I, I just read recently two species of bumblebees native to North America are apparently gone. And, you know, this has been going on as soon as you move to industrial agriculture and industrialization. It's, uh, you know, you got to look at more than just what's profitable. Uh, how about this one? They, for 50 years now, I think 50 plus, they've been following human male sperm counts in much of Europe and North America. Guess what? They're down 50% or probably more than that now. Uh, and that decline is speeding up. I think it's going down 2% or 4% a year now. I don't know, does that get, is that a priority? Is, is uh, you know, I, I look at what these debates in Washington about, or, or in my county or in my town, and it's like, where the hell are your priorities? You know, I, I think we're just so focused on the economy and the money and, and it's, it's uh, but, I, th I think it'd be good if this kind of information was part of the debate. Uh, there is some good news. The, I don't want to leave you just you know, walking out of here. <laughs> there are more farms now. The decline in the number of farms and, in, and the increase in the size of the farms, is, it's starting to turn around. The number for sure, we're starting to add farms, and they're small farms, and they're p individuals who largely are much more aware and focused, and, and you know, they put environmental uh, concern at the top. It's, it's a part, of the, part of the equation in, in their businesses. It's, we, I was out there talking to uh, an individual from, I think, Wisconsin about Will Allen. He's got a business called Growing Power. He got a MacArthur Fellowship uh, Genius Award be I, after being a professional basketball player and of all things a, a successful marketer for I think like Procter & Gamble for 10 years you know, in the corporate world. He retired and said, what am I gonna do with my life? Uh, and he wanted to go back to his roots, which I guess was agricultural, I think down in the deep south. He decided he wanted to farm. And I think he had played basketball in Milwaukee, and he knew that people were, were starving for good food. You know, you, all they had was processed, I won't call it garbage, but it's heading in that direction, you know, from the, from the quick fill or the, the gas station or the little, the, little, the little convenience store. Thank God there's that. Uh, so he started an urban, an urban farm. And he needed help, so he got young people to help him. And uh, it's called Growing Power, and you check that out. It, Will Allen, uh, just a great guy. But these, there was not a, such a thing as a CSA 20 years ago. There's a lot of CSAs. Common people are, st you know, it's getting out there. I think the, most people are still price, 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 price. And, this doesn't only go to the manufacturers and the growers, it also goes to the consumer. You know, if you're buying the cheapest, if you're buying industrially produced agriculture, you're, you're supporting pesticide applications. We all can do things. Uh, I encourage you all to start farming, and I know most of you are. I'm getting tired. <laughs> I can't do what I used to, but I'm... I'm starting to get smart, starting to, a little bit anyway. I'm starting to get some young help, and I'm, I'm looking out there for people that want to learn what I know, and I've gotten some great help the last few years that way, and they're happy, I'm happy, everybody's benefiting. Uh, it's keeping this old guy going. Uh, there's a lot of that happening. I've got to give credit where credit is due. The USDA, the U.S. government, has four Agricultural Research Service B labs, US, run by the USDA, they're part of the USDA. Uh, and one of them down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana is focused on uh, genetics and physiology. Oh, I skipped miticides. I skipped mites. I gotta go back. 
1984, free trade, free trade. Uh, the honeybee tracheal mite was introduced. It was discovered first in Florida. Uh, our bees had no resistance to it, and it was just devastating. It was tough on the bees in South, it was in the South, but since it really affects wintering bees more, uh, it was just a wipeout in the North. And it wiped out most of the feral colonies as, as well as uh, a large percentage of the commercially managed colonies. Uh, they found that they could develop, uh, or they could apply menthol crystals to the hive and it would vaporize and it treated for the mites, it helped, it wiped out the mites and, you know, so you're applying pesticides in your colony now. It is an organic compound, it wasn't terrible, but, and uh, some beekeepers took their lumps and actually uh, the bees were able to develop some significant resistance to these mites after the initial few years of wipeouts. Uh, unfortunately, to this day, since industrial queen producers, uh, many of them don't want to take any losses, uh, they continue to treat and their stock is, continues to be susceptible and they continue to sell this stock to beekeepers. But uh, researchers came out with some methods for, so that you could help the breeders develop resistance fairly quickly. It was a lot of work, uh, but it worked. And uh, some of us did participate in that and we have very quickly developed resistance stock. That was 84, uh, 87. The varroa mites came in, a lot tougher. Uh, Tibor Jabo is a great beekeeper, a good scientist, and a good researcher up in Ontario, Canada. And he, uh, he had been a breeder, a queen breeder. His after looking at the situation for a, a, a short time, he said trying to breed bees resistant to varroa mites is like trying to breed sheep resistant to wolves. And frankly, for about 10 years, 15 years, uh, 10 years anyway, that's the way I felt. I was trying and I was getting clobbered. You know, if I was making this much progress when I had to make this much, that's about it. It's about the best I could say I was doing, and I was, <laughs> if anybody looked at our income, uh, we weren't making a living. Somehow we, we, <laughs> we made it through, but uh, it was tough. Yeah, but the USDA and that, that lab down there, oh, I, I, gotta, I gotta keep with the pesticides now. I keep getting off track. Beekeepers started applying pesticides synthetic pyrethroids initially to control these mites. Uh, it was at very low levels, not very low mammalian toxicity, so it's okay for people, supposedly at that level. And it probably wasn't real bad, but mites are very good at res developing resistance to chemicals. Their populations turn over very quickly and and it didn't take long before they were resistant. So, you know, your average uh, home chemist, uh, we have quite a number of those in the beekeeping industry, and the bigger they are, the more likely they are to want to save a, uh, a penny. Uh, they started mixing stronger formulations, their own formulations, really sloppy ways of applying it to, into a colony, more residues. Well, at higher levels, all of a sudden the, the, the drone, the sperm counts in the drone started going down. And, okay, what do we do? So the scientists, uh, the scientific community found an organophosphate. Ugh, an organophosphate, you know, nerve gas. That's what it came out of the old World War II nerve gas research uh, class of pesticides. Uh, and it was introduced at a low enough dosage and in a way that it didn't get 
the residues weren't horrible, but they were there. And these organophosphates, you know, it's total, the total amount, and you know, you're getting it from other things too, and there's synergies of these pesticides. So, you know, beekeepers, after a while, beekeepers were hurting their own colonies, trying to control the mites, they were hurting the bees as well. Uh, okay, now back to the USDA and the Baton Rouge lab and Dr. Tom Rinderer, uh, a fella who worked his way through graduate, he's 35 years he's been the, the research director at the Baton Rouge Bee Lab. Uh, he worked his way through college, through graduate school, ex making honey and extracting it and selling it. So this guy's got bees down to the core. And he's a good researcher, a good scientist, but he's got bees at heart. And he thought, you know, these mites came in from East Asia. They're native to East Asia. There's a long history of beekeeping in Russia. And they settled their country at the same time and in the same way that we settled our west, they settled their east. They built a transcontinental railroad at about the same time. They put settlers, most in Russia's case, most of them, a lot of them were Ukrainian, who are great beekeepers, on the trains and they'd go out there and homestead or whatever they called it out there, and they took their bees with them. And Tom thought, you know, presumably one would guess that these bees have been exposed to those mites for a long time. And they're the same stock. Now they've been isolated in a different location, but so they've changed some. But he went over there and some of the staff went over, they took several trips and they, it looked like indeed they, 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 there was some resistance. And they found out, now those, those folks were having some trouble with varroa mites and they did have some less effective maybe, but also less damaging uh, treatments. They were using organic compounds or organic acids. Uh, some were using a little bit of oxalic acid, some formic acid, some were using nothing at that point, and they were having some success, some good success. So they went to the little mom and pops, the ones that had been passing their bees on from generation to generation. They didn't go to the old collectives, what was left of the old collectives, because they would probably hurt the resistance by bringing in European stock from Europe. Uh, they went to the little guys and they brought back, I think, 364 or five different families, different strains, different lines of bees from these little mom and pops all over the Primorsky area of Siberia. And they brought them back and put them in isolation to make sure there wasn't anything bad in them and, uh, and looked at, tried to find those with the most resistance and the most desirable characteristics and they settled on 18 lines of bees which they passed on to the industry and some of us now are raising these bees which now allow me, it was such a weight off to not, to not take the losses and not have to put any chemicals in my hive. Uh, I had to tweak my management a little bit but these bees from Siberia are pretty darn resistant to the mites and, and they're cold hardy and they're resilient, tough sons of guns. But they can't take the chemicals you know, they can't take the pesticides. Uh, but that's been, a, it's, it's been wonderful. And there's Mother Nature's taken her part. That Baton Rouge lab also uh, did some intense research and focused on a single trait uh, and have passed a bee on that's not a commercially viable bee as far as productivity because it's been inbred to get this trait. But Beekeepers can now use this, this single trait. I'd love to tell you all about these traits because they're really amazing, but there's no time. But anyway, a lot of beekeepers are using this to help their very susceptible stock to, get, to go up a couple rungs on the ladder of resistance. And so now they can actually start effectively, more effectively uh, selecting for resistance. They don't have to treat as often so they can challenge their bees and, and, and there's good things happening that way. There's, uh, now, I think it's only 
it's only been uh, possible for this to happen in the last few years because of mother nature and because of these breeding programs. I'm just a little breeder, but I've shipped queens to every state in the union, except for Hawaii, which is closed to outside bees. So it's out there and the wild bees are coming back in the trees and, and people are losing swarms and, and, and it's wonderful. That's great news. Uh, so there's, there's some good things happening. There's these little organizations popping up, no treatment beekeepers. And most of them aren't making a living at it. I, you know, they, they, uh, they really hammer the commercial, some of the commercial guys that are, are doing some treatments. Uh, but it's, you know, we're all trying to make a living. And frankly, the farm, a lot of the farmers are too. Some of the farmers aren't out there applying those chemicals because they want to. It's because that's the only way they know how to survive and grow that food. And if we just stopped immediately, there'd be mass starvation. You know, the farmer, the, there's some good farmers out there. There's some good people that are using this stuff. Uh, and we've got to help them make the change by, by going out and paying extra for organic. Or to hell with the badge. If you know somebody's growing using organic methods or sustainable methods, uh, whether they've got the USDA badge or not, uh, know your farmer and, and, and uh, support them. And, uh, and there's, there's uh, light at the end of the tunnel there, and we've got we to gotta really light those candles and help those people and do it ourselves. Presently, in current days, uh, half, over half of the bees in the country are in California, are moved to California in the months of, they're there in February and March, to poll, they're needed to pollinate the almond crop. Over half of the bees in the country. Uh, colony collapse disorder, which was, you know, let's call it the straw that broke the camel's back, and I'll say the biggest change at that time was the neonicotinoids. And then the viruses and the, you know, they started seeing these viruses and nosema, which is a back, uh, fungal disease. All these things that come in when they're stressed, you know, oh, it's this, oh, it's that. It's, it's life in the 21st century. It's all of these things. It's an unhealthy environment. The almond industry wasn't getting the bees they needed. That's a very focused, organized, lobby and they joined with some beekeepers that would like to make some money being the middleman in this exchange between bees from Australia and selling it to the beekeepers <laughs> and lo and they opened the border temporarily they've closed it now uh, in fact those those Australian bees had not been exposed to a lot of these things they were behind the curve of what we'd already gone through like Russia had been uh, some, with some of the mites 100 years and 150 years ahead of us. Now uh, uh, they opened the border, uh, but those bees were so susceptible to everything. It wasn't ideal, and beekeepers have reacted and are uh, being, not doing so many pollinations. They're picking their spots a little better, and, and uh, uh, so the, you know, it kind of stabilized, but you know, until the next time. I think it's great that people are being exposed to any kind of agriculture in the city because I'm sure there will be individuals that are exposed to that that just say, hell, that's what, I, you know, like, uh, like these boys. They were born and raised in the city. They were born in the city. And, you know, it doesn't have the history of a multi-generational farm, but it's got tremendous energy. <laughs> And, and open to new ideas, and that's, I think that's good. Yes, there are some, some different, they don't have as many, as many agricultural chemicals, so they've got a lot of chemical applications in residential situations, but there are also uh, a diversity of plantings. You know, uh, unlike a lot of rural areas. Uh, so the best honey crop I ever made was out of my backyard in Berkeley, California, probably in 1978 or 79. I'm a, I'm a small 
a commercial beekeeper, as you'll find, that does it full time for a living. But part of that is because I'm a breeder. I pack my own honey, but I, I breed queens and bees. Yeah. One last thing on the pesticide thing, when they were testing for these residues, they moved some bees into crab apples. There had been an application of imidacloprid. I forget what the commercial name was, but it was, the chemical was imidacloprid, one of the neonicotinoids, neonics for short. Uh, and, it, uh, and then they put pollen traps on the hives and collected the pollen that the bees were gathering from the crab apples and they measured the level of imidacloprid in the pollen. A, a year later, they returned the bees, moved them in again, some bees in, put the pollen traps on. There had been no application in that previous period. So it was over a year now, and they measured the levels, and it was higher a year later. It was more concentrated in the pollen. You read the label of clothionidin, and it, which is a neonicotinoid, and says, you know, nicotine, you know, they use, have always used that for a pesticide, and it worked pretty good, and, you know, but it had a problem, it broke down. This stuff is stable in the environment. It just keeps killing. I don't know how long it takes to break that stuff down, but... <coughs> Just remember the good stuff that's happening, okay, folks? And, and support that. Thank you.